Ronald Mayer. The vision for residential care that was presented to me when I interviewed experts for my book was of people being supported to stay in their homes longer, and we've been touching on this already, but the care they go into eventually becoming much more professional and person-centered and specialist for, in effect, the last stage of the dementia journey. Now, <coughs> is this practicable, and what would it take to realize it? Okay. Well, it is practicable. We're not there. So, right now... And what would it take to get us there? Okay. Well, not surprisingly, some of that's about investment. We cost of having somebody in a nursing home £580 a week. That's, that's three pounds, sorry, if, it's, if, the, if the care, you know, that's exactly what local authorities pay for care that they purchase. People who pay for their own care may pay more. We'll come to that in a minute. Sorry, well, let me. Let, let Ronald answer let, the question. Let me, let, me, let me finish. What I'm saying is, actually expecting that you could have excellent care for £3.45 an hour is, is laughable. That's why, that was why it got that reaction. So the investment in the care and in the staffing, you know, if you think that the cost of having somebody in a, in a hospital, is, if it's a general hospital bed, 14, 1,500 pounds a week, if it's an acute hospital bed, upwards of 3,000 pounds a week. So expecting high quality care to be delivered at the levels that we do, uh, in truth, local authority provided care, cost is about 800 pounds a week. Cost if people pay for their own care, upwards of that. We need higher levels of investment, but we've also got to invest in the workforce. We do actually have to value people who do the care uh, and, a, and invest in the training that's being talked about. But if we're going to attract people into the profession, uh, they, uh, then we're going to have to have a career structure, we're going to have to have, uh, have rewards at the moment care homes and some care at home services in some parts of the country are competing with Lidl's and Tesco's to attract people. Uh, that's, that's not what we want. We've got to say, you know, that we, we value care provision, we value the people who deliver the care, that we are prepared to invest in it. Now, just so it's clear that, I, so that I'm not in any way defending poor practice, money isn't the only determiner of quality of care. There is issues to do with leadership. There's this, th we obviously do have to have clear standards. At the moment, we reckon probably anything up to 80% of the older people, and I take your point that it's not only older people, but older people in care homes, about 80% of those uh, will have an element of dementia. Uh, yet we don't actually commission dementia care. We, com we commission a kind of standard care model. So we actually also have to look at, at whether we are creating the right environments, dementia-friendly environments. There are care homes who have, have, in, have off their own bat invested in having the right sort of environment, having the right sort of staffing levels, having the right sort of uh, services and, and inputs, but they are fewer and further between. <laughs> so we actually have to say we need a consistency of approach to, to residential care across the country, but one that is not just about knocking mm -hmm. care, because the, the ideology, so the rhetoric would say, home's best, care's bad. Okay, uh, so, uh, so, so, so where, where is this to come from then, the investment? Right. Is, this, is this councils, is this government, is this, well, is this families, or yeah, what? I, so, sorry, I think, sadly, as a society, although we say we value older people, the way we invest in care for older people would suggest we don't really. That we want to warehouse older people instead of actually providing a positive life enhancing experience for them. So we've actually got to say, uh, collectively as a society, I'm prepared to pay more in my tax to have decent care for, uh, for older people. Uh, you know, if it is a choice between Trident missiles, a new fourth bridge, or good care, ho care provision, then maybe just we have to say, care for older people comes first and we'll, we'll do the, some of those other things if we've got the money. At the moment, there's a threshold being set in terms of, so the numbers go up, the pot remains the same, so the amount you can spend on each older person or each person with dementia goes down. 
That is not the way we're going to secure quality care going forward. As I say, it's not all to do with the resources. We need to get the, 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 the leadership and management of care services right as well. But uh, uh, we, we do need to actually invest to get the, the, the quality of care. I think care. it's time to go to your alter ego, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've never been described as that before. But um, uh, actually, a lot of what Ronald says I agree with. Uh, even if the point about Trident was a wee bit far out, uh, perhaps. <laughs> um, uh, but I mean, his, his point is well that, absolutely. that, that, that your, your pot kind of stays the same, doesn't it? That yes, you know and I agree with him on that. I agree with him. I mean, what, what we did um, maybe six months to a year ago is we recognised that we had a structural problem with the sector. There were too many care homes performing uh, at levels of quality which were unsatisfactory. Um, and and yet, we recognised the challenge in terms of investment. Uh, so, so what we said is that we would um, take some time to set out a prospectus for change. And, and we've done some of that work. Just, uh, and what we said is a few things. Firstly, we want to see greater levels of personalisation so that people can exercise more choices within uh, care homes. We've always had circumstances in Scotland where people can choose between care homes, but not very much within in terms of how, how they go about their daily living, the, the sort of how, when, what, why, where of care. We want to be able to empower people in uh, circumstances where they're living in residential care. Secondly, we want to uh, ensure that into the future, care homes are more readily um, uh, situated within a, a sense of place, a sense of community, uh, where they are not isolated from the, the schools and uh, clubs round about, but they're actually a part of a vibrant community of interests uh, that are connected uh, to the institutions uh, themselves, but also uh, to the people who live uh, within them. Uh, thirdly, the workforce. I think that's been touched on not just by panel members uh, uh, tonight, but also uh, by people in the audience. Uh, the reality is that we do not pay enough for social care uh, in, in Scotland. Uh, we do pay uh, at times uh, minimum wage, and that isn't going to be ever and it, uh, it gets to a place where we can deliver the quality output that we but actually Forgive me, want. is this a wish list from COSLA or are you actually putting forward ways in which you're going to realise this? No, this is, this what, we, what we try to do is uh, sit alongside uh, that wish list, if you like, uh, an, implementa an implementation strategy. So we do intend uh, to deliver against that. Now, that's not to say that all of that's immediately realisable. Take the, the minimum wage, for example. I mean, I could have went back to council leaders this year and said, <coughs> let, let's pay the living wage in this sector, but by the way, you're going to have to pay 10, 15 percent on uh, the fee structure that you had agreed uh, compared with last year. So there's a certain sense that we need to make progress towards, and not all of that will be immediately realisable. But it's about setting out that ambition and saying, how can we make incremental progress towards those goals? Um, and I think, I think in time, uh, we will get there. I, I, I think. I think people realise that we can't go on as we are. Okay, um, I'm going to take Henry and then Malcolm and then Jeff and then questions. Okay, so <coughs> a, a fairly brief comments maybe yeah. because we are running out. Well, one of, one of the things that one of the things I think is crucially important here is that we need to always remember that people should make a choice about this. And and I think that the and Leslie can probably talk more about the issues of capacity as people go through the the elements and the types of challenges they've got about making decisions and planning for it. And what we hope we'll get better at is as we get better at post-diagnostic support and have difficult conversations, that we'll get a sense of what people see their futures looking like. And I, I think it's abhorrent that, that someone develops dementia, we know the types of, sort of like, you know, challenges they're going to face, and we never talk to them about how they'd like to be supported during that time. So then someone goes into an acute hospital, a decision is made about residential care, there's not been any real discussion or planning for that, people in residential care don't know the person too well. That fundamentally is the problem is that we don't give people the choice of engaging in discussion. And until we start doing that, we will never really know how many people wanted to be in residential care, how many people chose that. And th that's really important because that's, a, that's where they're going to end their life and that's a big, big cost to them and their family. They're just incapable of having these discussions so we've got to get over that. Okay. So, sorry, we've, we've, we've heard quite a lot from you. Thank you. Um, Malcolm. <coughs> my um, experience in health. W one is around the role of inspection. And from a health service perspective, 
healthcare improvement Scotland's inspections of uh, care of older people in acute settings. There have been a number of very critical reports produced as a result of that, which have helped to lever up standards. Now, I, I, I welcome the, the, what the care inspector is doing with Healthcare Improvement Scotland to have a joined up inspection regime, and I, and I think that's important. And the other bit of learning from the health service is actually um, we need to give people career prospects. We need to value them. And I, I think one of the things we've been able to do in the health service is to create an infrastructure that allows people, if they're going in as a band three or a band four in a support worker capacity, A, we're going to support them, B, they've got the opportunity to progress into some of the, the, the qualified professional areas, and, and they've actually got a career progression ahead of them. And I think that's a real challenge when we've got so many hundred different employers of, of support workers in the community settings. So how can we give them support in what they do and give them career prospects that they, they can actually progress mm -hmm. and they're not going to get poached by you know, a, a retail operation mm -hmm. down the road? Is it, is it possible, Jeff, to do any of this without massive more investment? I mean, does it... I mean, uh, not all the problems that we're talking about tonight come down to money, but does this not actually valuing staff and, and paying them what their job's worth? I, I think a large component of this will be about money. Um, certainly that's been the experience in other countries. Um, Japan's just gone through the process of adding a further 2 or 3 percent to VAT, largely to fund the cost of future dementia services. So that, that's the choice that's very perhaps made. And you know, if we, if we Has that ever been <laughs> on the, the, the agenda in oh cabinet, as far as I know? Well, VAT, of course, is a reserve. <laughs> <laughs> VAT, of course, is a reserve matter, um, and so um, <laughs> it, 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 it's really a question for Mr. Cameron uh, rather than for Mr. Salmon, um, and, and the current arrangement. Um, the, but but you know, they've they've had to basically. Hands up, who'd be willing to pay extra VAT for this? Yeah, yeah ring yeah. ring fence. That's interesting. Okay, that, that's good, because tomorrow what we'll do is we'll bring in another group of people with another challenge, <laughs> and they, they can make us the same offer, and at some point you'll all be paying 80% VAT, just, just yeah. so we can understand that hypothecating is really quite challenging. I think it does come back a wee bit to the discussion we had about acute, which <coughs> I think our, the point we got to in that was, ideally we wouldn't like to go to acute or to a general hospital setting, um, and it's not sustainable. If we imagine that we get to the point that Japan's in now, in terms of the prevalence of dementia in the population, we, we get there in about 18 to 20 years. Um, if, if we kept the number of care home beds equivalent to what we have now relative to that population, the idea that we're going to double the number of care home beds in the next 20 years and improve the quality simply isn't going to happen. You know, in, in, in the, and that's not just about liquidity, because the other problem Japan have is that having created the resource to actually fund the service, they cannot fill 20% of care packages because they don't have the people to deliver the service. So you know, there's, a, there's a point at which this does come back to creating capability within communities and in families and post-diagnostic support and everything that we can do to help carers uh, and others manage more effectively. W one of the big messages we took out of the dementia engagement event before this strategy came from people caring for people with dementia who said, we would like to get the same sort of quality of training that you offer to your staff about how we can actually manage practical issues, how we can understand the illness. And I think that's one of the big challenges, which is creating that broader understanding of dementia across the piece. So 3% on VAT, double the number of care home beds. You know, there's fairly a number of really I'd quite challenging options. I'd settle for a, for a smaller, better resource, pay, pay yeah. a sector that would actually be able to to do the job well and to look at the alternatives. But one very practical thing, which maybe we, Malcolm, we could pick up, I mean, is at the moment, the Scottish Government says we've got a surplus of nurses in Scotland, an actual surplus. We've not got a shortage of nurses in Scotland. Trying to get sta nursing staff to recruit them to the care sector is awfully hard. Maybe there's a way in which people can remain within the NHS family, but be deployed to working in care homes. We need to actually work on developing the integration in a very practical, hands-on way. So I think, you know, it would also improve the skills and experience of some of the, some of the nursing staff coming from the NHS. We, we've got divides, silos, and we have to work out with the, uh, those silos, I think. Yeah, and I think there's opportunities for the NHS 
has to bring some of its educational infrastructure to bear within mm -hmm. care homes. So, for example, you know, we've got some of our pharmacy practice um, educators working in care homes. We've got some of our nursing practice educators who are working in care. So what, you, what you're describing actually might be one hour of the way forward. Thank you. Henry. Sorry, I just pick up the point Jeff made. I, I think one of the things that our health and social care system has never done ever is understand the assets and the values that families and their resources in their communities have. Uh, and and it's, it's that, that's, that's probably the most valuable, the most valuable contribution. And it's actually probably about 90% of the person with dementia in life. So we sit here and we talk about 10% and we, and we worry about how we structure that and we reorganize it. And we never look at that 90% and say, here's a person with a life, with a network and a vast resource. How do we use that? And I, I really believe every pound that the state puts in, if they marry it up to the resources that are there, it will get much better value. Uh, and we've operated this system of, uh, you know, you come to a service, you get a service, you're given it and you go away. And we never look deeply into a person's lives and understand how and we can make that. And what's the mandate to get that? Well, I, d d d as far as I'm concerned, good link workers and good dementia practice coordinators will be trained in this way of thinking. They will be trained to utilise all of these resources and skills and they'll marry that up to the professional skills and resources that are there. And then they'll get a good outcome for people. Now, that's possible. But, but we have just at the start of it in Scotland. A few comments from the floor. Yes. Just, um, just shout, I think we've got. On the Monopoly on Disabled in Edinburgh, um, I mean, it's very interesting. I think the general public just doesn't know what happens in a care home. When I took the job, some of my friends were very surprised. And we got chatting, and on average, they thought it must cost at least £200 to keep somebody in a care home for a week. And they weren't joking. People don't know what happens in care homes and they need to come and see. I mean, our home is very much part of the community. We have 30 odd volunteers who come into the home every week and do help us with a multitude of different things. We are training our staff. I have run five workshops on promoting excellence in the last three weeks. I've covered two thirds of our staff team from the gardener to the kitchen staff. I've got another couple of workshops to do. You know, there is great stuff happening in care homes, but it doesn't get out into the media. But if we were being abusive to our residents, we'd be all over the front page of the evening news, but not when we do good things. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, I think we will um, move on <laughs> very, very swiftly. We haven't got a lot of time to, to talk about early diagnosis and stigma, which, which I, I had hoped to go into, but I do want to hear from you, um, Leslie. Um, I'm sorry I haven't come to you more often okay, because there hasn't been a specific <laughs> sort of <laughs> legal question in there. But, but you know, clearly uh, diagnosis and so on has, has a big impact <coughs> on um, the kind of legal decisions that you would feel people need to be thinking about yeah. much earlier. Well, I really, um, we're talking about power of attorney, um, but it... Ideally, it would be better if people put a power of attorney in place before there is a crisis, before there is a diagnosis, because <coughs> situations are stressful enough at that point without having to deal with a solicitor and legal matters. Um, so what needs to be done? What, 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 what kind of structure needs to be in place to get people to think about it then before? To think about putting a power of attorney in place? Yeah, I mean, is that not your... Presumably that's your sort of clarion call. Is yes. It to get um, to well, we're all the same. We all think we're invincible. None of us want to talk about wills or powers of attorney or what's going to happen to us in old age or, you know, if, if an accident befell us or whatever. Um, recently there's been a campaign by Glasgow City Council and Greater Glasgow and Clyde um, to start the conversation about power of attorney and quite a lot of adverts on <coughs> TV over Christmas. And really it's just to get families talking about it and making arrangements, putting legal frameworks or, or legal documents in place in advance of anything happening so that when a crisis occurs, the paperwork's there. A lot of people think, um, especially elderly people, if they put a power of attorney in place, they're giving away all their powers. And that's not in fact true. Um, your attorney has to comply with the principles of the Act. They shouldn't be doing anything that you can do for yourself. Um, and there are certain triggers you can put into your power of attorney document for p certain powers to come into to play. Um, but yeah, it is difficult. And the older people get, I think it becomes more difficult. Thank you very much. Is it, yeah. Um, yeah. Is there any way it's possible to 
plus 70 pounds to register the document with the Office of the Public Guardian. Yeah, but depending on the person's financial circumstances, depending on the level of income, level of capital, and actually their age, they might be eligible for advice and assistance from the Legal Aid Board. So they might not have to pay anything at all, or they might have to make a contribution towards the cost. Thank you, and there was a question there, then I'll come to you. Yeah. help with the hospitals would take note of the fact that one has power of attorney because I haven't always found that the case yes, and I think fact, that's a, a very important thing because you, you said you sometimes felt thwarted yeah um, and, there was a, there was and a it's question. been mentioned um, you know that, that the family is a huge resource it is yeah and if the family has power of attorney it would help if it was recognized a bit more I think yes I was trying Sorry, to find I a question that came, that came in here. by Facebook um, about the fact that hospitals don't seem to take of the um, um, Adult Incapacity Act in terms of, of um, listening to people who have got power of attorney or, or guardianship issues. Yeah, they, they, are yeah they, they should be noting on the, the patient's uh, notes that a power of attorney is in place and who the attorney is, and they should be contacting that person if the patient is mentally incapable of making decisions for, for himself or who's in place. 